So in this video, we're going to look at Confucianism. Now, uh, you might wonder what a video on Confucianism is doing in a playlist titled Introduction to World Religions. After all, Confucianism isn't technically a world religion, and it, you know it's not. Right? I'm not arguing that it is. But I am going to ask why. <laughs> so the next set of videos, uh, the, we will look at the subjects of these next videos, and we will ask the question whether this is a religion or not. Now, some of them explicitly are religion, some of them explicitly are not. But we probably still room to ask the question of why. <laughs> uh, so, uh, from, like I said, this one, we're going to take a look at Confucianism. Now, there's a couple of things to remember about Confucianism. kind of helps to place it in the conceptual landscape, so to speak. Uh, the first thing about Confucianism, especially what might set it apart from other sorts of ideas, is that the basic unit of humanity uh, is relationship. It's not the individual. What is going to determine the success of humanity is going to be um, your, you know, the measure of what you are, right, is not based upon you, right? It's based upon your relationship to others. Now, you know, this is really different from uh, a typical uh, 21st century American mindset, of course, right? We very much favor the individual over relationship. But, um, you know, it's individual rights that matter, right? That, that sort of thing. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, to be fair, right? the word humanity does not mean human, right? It's, it does not refer to a specific human or even, you know, necessarily human nature. We could think of it as, you, you know, our human nature. Okay, that's one way to interpret it. But another way to interpret it is all of humanity. And when you talk about all of humanity, we're talking about all individual humans and the relationships they have to one another. So for Confucianism, what's important is the relationships that one has to other human beings. This is going to determine who and what you are. Another important thing about Confucianism is not really a, you know, it's not really a way of uh, belief, right? They don't sit down and tell you to believe along this of things. Rather, it, it, it's, it's action, right? It's what you do as opposed to what you believe. Now, there's two big concepts, or, you know, there's several big concepts, so, you know, that, that kind of, like, go hand in hand. The first one is Ren. Now, literal translation is something like virtue. Another way of thinking about it is, is how you become a person. So Ren is developed through community life. Who you are is, the, is informed by what you do and how you act with others. It's uh, the relationships you form with others. And, you know, the, the family is kind of the starting point for Ren. And who you are in the family is, or by, that, by what that means is how you behave and what you're supposed to do within the, fa uh, within the family. Uh, that is kind of an analogy for everyone else. For, uh, for Ren, not only do you care for and uh, look out for your individual family member, or yourself and individual family members, but for everybody, right? You're one big community. This leads us to Lee. Lee is yes, something like propriety of formal behavior. Now, you know, Ren is is how you know, one of the ways to look at Ren is how you care for others, how you. Um, relate to others. You know, Lee is something like propriety, manners, formal behavior, that's what they think of as very structured manners. Now, without Ren, Lee is just simply formalism. Right? It's just behavior with no intention or care. Right? So, <laughs> something that we do here in, in, in the West is you know, we're very, you know, someone says, how are you? And say, oh, well, fine. But you know, usually you're not really thinking about it, right? Or, hey, good to see you. Right? But you're not really thinking about it. It's just something you say. Right? But with Ren, right, you have you know, what's added to the formalism for the formal behavior of Lee is this propriety, is, I'm sorry, it, it is this caring about your function and place within the society. Now, when you do well, 
when you do well following Lee and developing this Ren, you become somebody kind of like a hero in a way. You become somebody who's praiseworthy. You care about others and you work uh, within the society. Now it's important to remember that for uh, uh, for Ren, it doesn't really matter what successes you have, right? That isn't what makes you a person, right? You, you know, you you get sales manager of the year, right? That's not important. Uh, it doesn't really matter your station in life. It doesn't matter whether you're a policeman. It doesn't matter whether you're uh, a farmer or you know, a, a judge. What's going to determine whether you've done a good job or whether you know you're praiseworthy, or where you've achieved this, you know, the day is, is the word day. Uh, is if you acted according to Ren. Right? You worked within your station, regardless of what your station is. Now, there's some characteristics of Confucianism. And the first one is, is the, the study. Right? If you're following Confucianism, you study your own cultural heritage. Right? You look after, yeah, you look towards and try to understand what's happened in your history what's happened uh, in your past, in your present, how your culture works now, uh, not only, you know, you know, and primarily to find your place in it, to act according to Lee and to act with Rin. Well, you know, once you learn these lessons about your culture, well, then you act on them. You act on it, right? You try to, you know, once you've learned your place within the culture and how to care for others, once you've learned your place in the big extended family, right, you act on that. You don't just ignore it. You don't just learn it and, and set it aside. And finally, I, uh, your social success, you know, I said this already, your social success is measured by Ren, not by your place, like in the hierarchy of society, and even, you know, what awards or accolades you've won. As far as that's concerned, day is what matters, whether you're praiseworthy not so much the awards or the station you have in life. And kind of what's on the flip side of day, right, is shame. Shame. Somebody who has day cares for other people, works within the society, right? Has, you know, develops all of oneself, maxim, you know, tries to cultivate one's abilities and talents for the benefit of everyone. That's, that's day. The self-sufficient person who doesn't care about others, who thinks that he's actually independent of others, right, that person has shame. Right? They have shame, you know, even if they're acting according to Lee, right? They have shame because they're not concerned with others. And they don't care what others say. So, uh, again, the success, then, is measured by Ren. If you don't fulfill Ren, well, then, then you're shameful. Now, you know, I said that Confucianism isn't really about beliefs, and, and, and primarily it's not, but there are three things that Confucius takes, or thinks that, that is true. And that, that human nature, uh, you know, essentially is endowed with a capacity for good. Right? It's not inherently flawed, it's not inherently evil, that sort of thing. But, you know, since we have this capacity for good, what follows from that is that we should act on it, right? We should be good, and we should be good for the sake of being good. After all, that's what we do, right? That's part of our human nature, is that we uh, uh, do the good. And, you know, if, if you do good, right? if you do good, then others will be inspired and the culture, the uh, society will prosper. Right? So not only should you do good, but when you do so, everybody, the society itself, will improve. Right? You'll, you'll achieve that day, right? You'll have that day. And since you are this hero, you're somebody worth looking, out, looking up to, uh, you will uh, uh, you'll inspire others to do the same. Now, Confucius had a couple of, you know, say, attitudes or you know, beliefs about uh, religion. Um, but he, you know, a lot of people say he wasn't out to start his own religion. A after all, you, you know, the, the prevailing 
I guess you call it religion of the time, was ancestor worship. And yeah, I mean, it was the religion of the time when you worshipped your, your, your own ancestors. And again, you know, Confucius, you know, appealing to Confucianism probably isn't going to have a problem with this because he considers the culture, the relationship to, to be the most important thing. And so, of course, you're going to worship your ancestors, right? They are your family. And, you know, he thought that, sure, we can talk about ghosts and we can talk about spirits, but we shouldn't fall into superstition. Now, you know, what he's doing there, he's probably thinking, I, mean, I don't know any specific examples from ancient China, but in the West, right, we, what's a superstition? If you spill salt, throw some of it over your left shoulder to avoid bad luck, right? Well, there's, there's just no causal connection between the spilling of salt and bad luck, right? It's just, it doesn't make any sense. So he's probably trying to, set aside any sort of these weird superstitions. I mean, there's just no connection between some sort of behavior and, you know, one's ancestors or, or anything like that. So, uh, but he still thought there were ghosts and, and spirits. Okay. Um, but beyond that, you, you got to be real careful about trying to say anything further. Now, Confucius thought that heaven, uh, was very much involved in his life. Heaven gave him his mission. Heaven knew his actions. Heaven determined his fate. Now, before you think that, it's like, well, hold on a second, didn't we just get finished with that whole superstition stuff? Well, remember, right? For Confucius, what's important is the relationship. Right? That's what's important, is relationship. And, um, I don't know exactly how to, how to phrase this. Um, you know, it makes all kinds of sense that uh, Confucius would think that there's something like, like heaven. Anyway, if he thought ancestor was worshipped, then sure, there's going to be a heaven. Now, heaven is not the celestial, rest, celestial wonderful place. Not necessarily that, right? Heaven is one's ancestors. Heaven is the community of the afterlife. Now, if you're willing to accept the idea that your current community, the, the corporeal community, has something to say and do with your life, right? They're all going to be involved in your life. After all, we're all involved with each other. Then it's not a stretch to think that heaven, you know, your ancestors, your deceased ancestors, that heaven is also involved in your life. Right? This is not so weird to say. Um, you know, if we consider that, that they're there. So it's, you know, it, this is part and parcel of Confucius' belief. It isn't something you just kind of tacked on to it. Now, and again, heaven is, again, this, this kind of community of his ancestors. So with the, the importance that ancestors and community have, well, of course he's going to think that heaven has at least something to do uh, with the way that his life is going. So this is kind of an overview of Confucius. Kind of an overview of Confucius. And you, really, the big thing to remember here is the importance that he placed on one's role in the society.